survival horror, an action-adventure subgenre created in the mid-1990s to describe certain video games that would try to frighten its players using a variety of different methods. Quite often, these games would be set in unsettling locations and try to make its players feel less in control by constricting their amount of ammunition, health, and inventory space. While a few games set the stage for survival horror, one in particular defined it, Resident Evil. The game shocked the world when it first hit store shelves in 1996 and inspired countless sequels, spin-offs, and clones. Many people often consider the next five to six years after Resident Evil's initial release to be the golden age of survival horror games, with its sequels being critically acclaimed and other popular series like Silent Hill and Fatal Frame making their debut. Near the tail end of this golden age, however, one person was becoming frustrated with the Resident Evil series' progression, its original director, Shinji Mikami, the man that would also go on to oversee and direct its fourth entry, Resident Evil 4. Long before there were any survival horror games, and Sony was better known for its Walkman portable tape player than its PlayStation consoles, a young Shinji Mikami did not have much of an interest in video games. One of his close high school friends, however, was obsessed with them and would often invite Mikami to the arcade, desperate to share his hobby with him. Mikami would decline each and every time, but his friend was not deterred so easily. One day, Mikami found a clipping from a gaming magazine that his friend had covertly left at his house. The clipping featured a wrestling video game, which piqued his interest as he had a fondness for martial arts and wrestling at the time. His friend had set a trap for him, and surprisingly, it had worked. Mikami finally gave in and decided to accept his friend's invitation to the arcade. Upon entering, he found himself enamored with the wide selection of games and almost instantly fell in love. After a few years had passed, Mikami was finally finishing up school and began to look for a job. He had one main goal, to work for a company that would allow him to create something. Disappointment set in though as Mikami was rejected for the jobs he had applied for. It was at this time that a friend who knew of his love for video games showed him a job ad. There was going to be a recruitment event at a hotel for a game company that was beginning to grow in size very quickly, a game company known as Capcom. Initially, Mikami had very little interest in working for Capcom, but being a poor student, he couldn't just turn away a free meal that the event was offering. One of the chairmen speaking at the event went into details about Capcom's goal and their future plans. Surprisingly, Mikami was inspired by the speaker's ambition and thought that this might be a company where he could be a good fit. He later visited Capcom to take the required written job test and do an interview. Unfortunately, he failed to pass the written test and was dismissed along with several others that had applied at the company. A week later though, Mikami received a phone call. A representative from Capcom told him that there had been a mix-up and he was actually going to be accepted for the job he had applied for. Years later, Mikami found out from his superiors that there had been no mix-up. The company just needed some extra hands and was convinced by its staff to hire some of the rejected applicants. A coincidence that would end up benefiting both Mikami and Capcom in a way neither of them would have ever expected. Mikami spent his earlier years at Capcom working mostly on Disney-licensed games like Aladdin and Goof Troop for the Super NES. In 1993, though, development began on the first Resident Evil, or Biohazard as it is known in Japan, with Mikami at the helm as director. The project originally began as a remake of Sweet Home, a horror RPG exclusive to the Japanese Famicom that is often credited as laying the groundwork for the survival horror genre. Sweet Home's director, Tokuro Fujiwara, wanted this new version to include many elements that he couldn't get into the original game. Fujiwara would not be directing this time around, though, as his role would be moved to producer on the project. Instead, he wanted Mikami to take the lead and become the director. Mikami was very opposed to this, though, as he hated being scared and felt like he wouldn't be a very good fit for the game. Fujiwara, however, chose him exactly because of this trait. He knew that Mikami would be perfect for a horror game because someone like him would understand what truly could frighten people for the project. Shortly into development, the project would drop the Sweet Home name and become a new original IP. But many of Sweet Home's elements, like the mansion setting, puzzle solving, and inventory space management would remain. 
Over the next few years, Mikami would take inspiration from George Romero's zombie films, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre movie, and 1992's Alone in the Dark video game to meticulously craft Resident Evil. The game took place in an ominous, secluded mansion that had become the scene of a viral outbreak and had turned its residents into zombies. Both Capcom and Mikami didn't have very much faith in the game, and it was not expected to sell many copies. Throughout its development, this showed as mostly newer staff and people that had extra time between projects were put to work on the title. In 1996, Resident Evil launched exclusively on Sony's new PlayStation console. To everyone's surprise, the game was a massive success, selling millions of copies and blowing Capcom's sales expectations out of the water. With the survival horror title becoming an instant hit and taking the video game industry by storm, a sequel was greenlit and immediately put into production. The next game saw Mikami move out of the director's seat to producer, and Hideki Kamiya, who had worked as a planner on the original game, take over as director. Resident Evil 2 was a much more ambitious title than its predecessor, and starred a rookie cop named Leon S. Kennedy who had to fight to survive a zombie outbreak in the heavily populated Raccoon City, a big change from the original Resident Evil's secluded mansion. The game was even more successful than the first title, breaking many previous video game sales records and proved that the series had staying power as a media juggernaut. The Resident Evil games would continue to grow in popularity as time went on, and soon development began on a new title that was planned to take the series to Sony's new upcoming console, the PlayStation 2. In 1999, work began on Resident Evil 4, but it was not the Resident Evil 4 that people are familiar with today. In fact, there were at least four different versions created of the game before the final one would eventually release six years later. Going into development, Mikami's main goal was to reinvent the series and come up with some new and different concepts that would shake things up from the tried and true formula of the previous titles. The first version of the game actually did make its way to completion, but when the dust settled, it was not a Resident Evil game anymore. Hideki Kamiya, after finishing up Resident Evil 2, would once again take over as director for this new title. He wanted to make this new sequel have a much bigger focus on action and possess a cooler and more stylish tone. The story would be based around a character named Tony, a man who was nearly invincible and possessed skills and intelligence way beyond that of a normal human being. The character would spend the majority of the game searching into the mysteries behind his superhuman abilities. Kamiya also wanted to get rid of the fixed camera angles that had become a mainstay in the series and instead create a more dynamic camera system. While this idea certainly would be a big change in the direction for the series like Mikami was hopeful for, he was not confident that this more stylish focus would work well with the survival horror theme the series had become known for, and convinced Kamiya and the team to make it a brand new IP completely separate from the Resident Evil franchise. This new IP would eventually become Devil May Cry, a series that would be incredibly successful for Capcom and continue on for many years to come. Resident Evil 4's development restarted shortly after Devil May Cry's release in 2001. By this point, the series had grown even larger with the releases of Resident Evil 3 Nemesis and Code Veronica. The staff that had been working on these games were becoming vocal about them starting to feel somewhat stale. They were getting bored of the recycled patterns and frustrated with the cookie cutter mold the series was falling into. Their goal to reinvent the series into something that felt fresh and new was becoming even more important than before. This new version of Resident Evil 4 saw one of Resident Evil 3's production staff, Hiroshi Shibata, taking over as director and would revolve around Leon S. Kennedy, the previously mentioned protagonist of Resident Evil 2, infiltrating the Umbrella Corporation's headquarters, a castle-like structure located in Europe. Umbrella had become a mainstay in the series as a nefarious pharmaceutical company that would constantly leave a trail of death and destruction in its wake. This version of the game was first announced in late 2002, but it would not be a PlayStation 2 title like originally planned. Instead, Capcom would develop and publish the game exclusively for Nintendo's GameCube console. A trailer would also be released that featured Leon running through a castle, but instead of zombies attacking him, he would be facing off against an entity made of black fog. Mikami was not convinced this was the correct direction for the game, however, and a new version would be shown off the following year at E3 2003. This new iteration is often referred to as the Hookman version, since in its trailer, Leon is pursued by a ghost-like man that attacks him with a metal hook on a chain. 
Lian is afflicted with a strange disease that causes him to hallucinate and see enemies that aren't actually there. He is attacked by animated suits of armor and knife-wielding dolls, as well as the aforementioned Hulkman. The scenario writer that came up with this concept had been inspired by a particular scene in the 2000 film Lost Souls, where Maya Larkin, a character played by Winona Ryder, is in a bathroom washing her hands when she suddenly hallucinates being in a dilapidated building and is pursued by a killer. People were impressed with the E3 trailer, especially the new mechanic where the camera would switch to an over-the-shoulder view whenever Leon took aim at enemies with his gun. Even with fans and critics dazzled by the footage shown off, Mikami still was not convinced that this version was going in the right direction, plus also had concerns with how costly it would be to make. Once again, the team scrapped what they had and started all over. The next development attempt saw the team try and return to the more standard Resident Evil formula. There is very little information about this version outside of it not innovating much on the previous titles in the series and including a lot of zombie-like enemies. As had become the norm at this point, Mikami once again stepped in and cancelled the project. This time, however, he dismissed director Hiroshi Shibata from his position. By this point, development on the game was taking incredibly too long, and something needed to be done to right the ship. Mikami had been extremely busy working on multiple other projects throughout the course of Resident Evil 4's tumultuous timeline, but now he would finally take the reins and see the game to completion himself as its new director. Making big changes to an established franchise people have come to know and love is almost always a big risk. Mikami knew this, but he was tired of the recycled ideas the Resident Evil series had clung to for years now and decided that it needed to evolve into something new. While he didn't want to completely remove the horror element from the game, he wanted the new focus to be on action and faster paced gameplay. He even told his team that the aiming and shooting aspect of the game was the most important part with nothing being in the second position, and horror being the third most important, to make sure they understood just how much of an emphasis he wanted on the action-oriented gameplay. Mikami asked his programmers to create a new camera system that would stay behind Leon the entire time, a huge departure from the fixed cameras many of the previous titles had used. The team working on this was worried about making such a big change to Capcom's Golden Goose, but Mikami kept pushing them, and after struggling for a while, they finally saw it to completion. This new third-person over-the-shoulder view allowed for the player to more easily deal with larger crowds of enemies and even target their specific limbs and body parts. Shooting their limbs would sometimes even cause them to stumble or drop their weapon, allowing for Leon to make a swift counterattack or a hasty retreat. These enemies would also now sometimes drop ammo and other items, letting players now engage in combat more confidently without the fear of limited ammo constraints found in the older titles. This helped push Mikami's goal of keeping the game more action-focused and giving Leon much more offensive power to take on his foes. The game sometimes even has an arcade-like feel to it. Leon can stagger an enemy, then follow up with a kick to put the enemy on the ground and also briefly stun other enemies in the vicinity, then combo into another stagger with a kick follow-up, and so on and so on. There is a certain flow and finesse to the combat that makes it feel unique and satisfying. While the horror theme wasn't Mikami's focus, it was still very much present in the game, with many gruesome boss encounters and death sequences. He also wanted to convey it in some other, more subtle ways. One of which was a sense of isolation and feeling cut off from the rest of the world, which was accomplished by putting Leon in a secluded rural area where everything is essentially out to kill him. The other was dealing with these many unpredictable and often overwhelming opponents out to end his life. To many people's surprise, zombies were completely removed from the game and replaced with the much more mobile ganados, translating to cattle in Spanish, that are able to use tools and weapons and can even dodge your attacks. Some of these ganados, like the chainsaw-wielding Dr. Salvador, are able to instantly kill Leon if they get too close to him no matter how much health he has, which adds to the unsettling terror, especially when you hear a chainsaw start to rev up in the distance and desperately start looking around trying to find out where the sound is coming from. After progressing into the game a bit, the Ganados start to become even more deadly and unpredictable, as the parasite in their body will sometimes burst through their head, making for a much more difficult fight. This can add a lot more tension to an encounter where you're already feeling overwhelmed, especially if you're running low on ammo or health items. The story takes place six years after the events of Resident Evil 2, 
Leon S. Kennedy, now a special agent, is sent into Spain to rescue the U.S. president's daughter, Ashley Graham, who has been kidnapped by Osman Sadler and his radical terrorist cult known as Los Illuminados. He arrives at a rural village and is almost immediately attacked by its residents, a group of farmers that have now been infected with mind-controlling parasites known as Las Plagas. Throughout his journey, Leon makes his way through the initial village, then into a large castle, and later onto an island that holds the cult's research facility. Along the way, he meets a large cast of allies, like Ada Wong, a spy that assisted him during the events of Resident Evil 2, and Luis Serra, a former Los Illuminados researcher, plus many enemies, including Ramon Salazar, the castle's ruler, and Jack Krauser, one of Leon's old comrades. Similar to one of the scrapped versions of the game, Leon is at one point infected with the Las Plagas virus, which causes him to act unpredictable and erratic at times throughout the story. Leon was altered from his original look during development to look tougher and help reflect that he had become more experienced over the years. But the team didn't want to make him too big and muscular in an attempt to maintain his sense of coolness. While Resident Evil 4 wasn't the first game in the series to utilize fully 3D polygonal environments, it was the first to give players full control of the camera and allowed the team to make expansive areas for players to explore and fight in. But working with this new system introduced new challenges, like having to blend indoor to outdoor transitions seamlessly. The team had to spend extra time making sure that they got these environments right, especially because it was a trait that the series had become well known for. The GameCube's extra processing power let them add to these environments, creating a more realistic atmosphere and utilizing creepy effects like mist and fog. Some of the assets and ideas from the cancelled iterations of the game were even reused and repurposed for this final version, presumably to help save on budget and development time. During a good portion of the game, you are accompanied by Ashley Graham, the character Leon is sent in to rescue, and must make sure to keep her protected. If she takes too much damage or is carried away by the enemy, you get an instant game over and must restart from your last checkpoint. Luckily, in earlier areas, there are certain dumpsters you can have her hide in to keep her safe while you take out the surrounding enemies first. She will also duck while you are aiming, allowing you to shoot at enemies she may be standing near. Protecting Ashley would also regularly add to the game's stress and tension, especially while having to deal with large hordes of enemies all at once. There is one brief point in the game where you even take control of Ashley while she tries to make her way back to Leon's location. It is during this section where things take on a much more classic survival horror feel since your combat options are very slim and you often must run away from and maneuver yourself around various enemies. This short interlude gives players a break from the more action-oriented gameplay and acts as a little nod to the series' roots. Another new feature added to the game were certain actions that could be activated when a button prompt showed up. Performing these would make Leon execute an action like jumping over an obstacle, leaping out of a window, or kicking a staggered enemy. They could also be more reactionary like having to jostle the analog stick back and forth to escape being grabbed by a Ganado. Similar to these character actions were the newly added Quick Time Events, or QTEs as they are often called. During these QTEs, a cinematic cutscene would play and the player would need to press the combination of button prompts or analog stick movements that appeared on screen. These often appeared when fighting many of Resident Evil 4's epic bosses, like El Gigante and the amphibious lake-dwelling Del Lago. In some instances, failing to press the correct buttons during these QTEs would result in an instant death, often with their own unique animations. One of Leon's battles with Jack Krauser actually consists entirely of QTE scenes. Resident Evil 4's boss sequences were certainly impressive from a graphical standpoint and even added in some interesting mechanics like navigating small maze-like corridors within a time limit and utilizing a zipline to lure a boss into a trap. One common mechanic present in all of the previous Resident Evil titles was inventory space management. This mechanic would remain in Resident Evil 4 but received some big changes to how it functioned. Players would have an attaché case that would be used to store weapons, ammunition, and healing items. The case would start small, but as you progress through the game, upgrades would become available for purchase that increased its size and the amount of storable items. The items in the case would show up on a grid and players would be able to rotate and maneuver these items to both make more space and organize them how they liked. Throughout the game, Leon will sometimes encounter an ominous looking merchant that will sell him various weapons and items as well as the larger attaché cases. What are you buying? Weapons can also be upgraded by the merchant, increasing attributes like their attack power, reload speed, and clip size. 
As you progress through the game, more weapons will become available for Leanne to purchase, each with their own particular strengths and weaknesses. Also hidden through the game are various treasures that can be sold to the merchant for extra money. These treasures are sometimes broken up into smaller separate pieces that can be reassembled for a huge increase to their value. Funnily enough, Paul Mercier provides the voice acting for both Leon and the merchant. Stranger. Later on, a shooting range minigame can be accessed where Leon tries to obtain a high score by shooting moving cutouts of the Ganados. He is restricted to using only a certain combination of provided weapons which adds to the challenge. Upon hitting certain score milestones in these modes, players are rewarded with bottle cap figurines based on characters in the game. When you complete each set, you are rewarded with additional money that can be spent at the merchant. Upon finally completing the game, players are rewarded with two additional game modes, The Mercenaries and Assignment Ada. The Mercenaries is an arcade-style minigame where players kill as many enemies as possible within the time limit and try to obtain the highest score possible. While this mode starts with Leon as the only playable character, more characters can be unlocked, including Ada Wong and Jack Krauser, plus Hunk and Albert Wesker from the earlier Resident Evil games. Assignment Ada is a brief non-canon scenario where you take control of Ada Wong and must collect Las Plagas samples in the game's island research facility. Completing the game also awards you with additional costumes and weapons. Leon can wear his Raccoon City Police Department uniform from Resident Evil 2, Ashley gets a white pop star outfit, and Ada can wear her black combat gear from the Assignment Ada mode. As for weapons, both the Infinite Launcher and the Matilda are unlocked for finishing the game, while the Chicago Typewriter is available after completing the Assignment Ada mode, and the Hand Cannon unlocks after obtaining a 5-star rank with all characters on all stages in the Mercenaries mode. After a few bumpy years of development, Resident Evil 4 was finally completed, and fans were excited to get their hands on it after being teased for so long. One question remained though, would they accept horror taking a back seat to this new focus on action and gunplay? January 11, 2005, Resident Evil 4 finally made its debut in North America exclusively on Nintendo's GameCube. It was received incredibly well by both critics and fans alike, and is still to this day one of the best reviewed games of all time. It received countless awards and was named Game of the Year by multiple gaming publications in 2005. A few weeks after the North American launch, the game hit store shelves in Japan, while fans in Europe had to wait until March to get the title in their hands. One thing was for sure, Mikami's risky gamble had paid off and showed that Capcom's popular series still had a very bright future ahead of it. Resident Evil 4 was supposed to be a GameCube exclusive, and Mikami had been very vocal about this, especially his famous quote that if the game ever released on any platform other than the GameCube, he would commit harakiri, a form of Japanese ritual suicide. In late 2004 though, just before the GameCube version was about to launch, Capcom rescinded its statement about the game's exclusivity and announced it would be releasing it on Sony's PlayStation 2 console in late 2005. Their reasoning for doing this was due to changing market conditions and the desire to increase consumer satisfaction, which assumedly is their way of saying we want to recoup costs from this game's long, troubled development and also tap into the PlayStation 2's massive user base. At this point in time, the PlayStation 2 was the market leader by a landslide, with its console install base being massive next to the GameCube's numbers. When the PS2 version eventually released in late 2005, it was very clear that it lacked the same graphical quality that the GameCube one offered, but most critics agreed that it didn't hamper the experience too much. While it wasn't quite as pretty, it did offer some new content not found in the GameCube version, the first of which was a new weapon called the PRL-412, an energy weapon that does massive damage to any enemy infected by Las Plagas and could even one-shot some of the bosses. This could be obtained by completing the game on its much harder professional difficulty level. Also included is a brand new game mode called Separate Ways, a canon five-chapter scenario that sheds some light on Ada Wong's actions throughout the game's main story campaign. Upon completing this mode, two new costumes would unlock, a mobster outfit for Leon and a suit of armor for Ashley. Ashley's new costume actually makes her invulnerable to all enemy damage and prevents her from being carried away by foes. All of this new extra content for the PS2 version would be included in almost all of the subsequent ports that would follow over the years. Before the GameCube and PS2 versions released, it was announced that they would feature multiple pre-order bonuses and collector's editions that included items like t-shirts, art cells, collectible tin boxes, 
art books, soundtrack CDs, and making of discs. Both versions sold very well, with the PS2 version surprisingly only outselling the GameCube version by about 700,000 units, given the massive install base it had. 2007 saw two more ports of the game released. The first was a pretty standard PC port published by Ubisoft. The second was Resident Evil 4 Wii Edition. This version utilized the Wii's motion sensing capabilities and featured updated point and shoot controls using the Wii Remote and Nunchuck controllers. The Wii Classic controller or a GameCube controller could be used as well to play the game with its original control scheme. In 2009, Capcom released an iPhone version of Resident Evil 4 that featured incredibly downgraded graphics, clunky controls, missing content, and slideshow cutscenes. It was apparent that Capcom was trying to cash in on the smartphone boom that was happening at the time, and most critics railed the game for its myriad of issues. The following year, an iPad version came out, but unfortunately it did not really improve on many of its predecessors' faults. A similar port of the iPhone version also released that same year on the Zebo, a 3G-enabled console exclusive to Brazil and Mexico. In 2013, an Android port finally was released, but it was the same disappointing iPhone version. Outside of Japan, Samsung bought the exclusive rights for this version of the game on their mobile devices. Capcom would later remaster the game in 2011 for the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360 consoles, and put them out as digital-only releases, though Japan would get a physical edition that also included Code Veronica's remaster. These new HD versions would also later be ported to the PlayStation 4, Xbox One, Nintendo Switch, and PC. Not only did the game see plenty of ports, it also saw some unique merchandise, like various action figures and the infamous chainsaw controllers for both the GameCube and PlayStation 2. As of 2020, all of Resident Evil 4's different versions have collectively sold over 10 million units, making it one of Capcom's most successful games to date. Resident Evil 4's initial two releases in 2005, the gaming industry certainly took note of what it brought to the table. The game's over-the-shoulder camera and aiming mechanics would go on to directly influence games like Gears of War and Dead Space, completely reinventing the third-person shooting genre. Its way of handling tension and action during combat sequences would inspire the designers of The Last of Us and Bioshock. And the game's camera use during exploration and scavenging helped 2018's God of War make its big change in gameplay similar to what Mikami had done with the Resident Evil series over a decade earlier. Even 15 years following its release, Resident Evil 4's mark on the industry is still being seen in the games made today. Not only did the game influence many other series, it also heavily influenced its own. The majority of the Resident Evil titles released after Resident Evil 4 all took a cue from it and leaned into the more action-oriented gameplay it had introduced. This would continue on for the next decade until Resident Evil 7 was revealed and the series would finally make its jump back towards an experience more focused on horror. A few years after Resident Evil 4's launch, Shinji Mikami would eventually leave Capcom and help found Platinum Games, with other former Capcom employees including the aforementioned Hideki Kamiya. During his time at Platinum, he worked as a contract employee out of his own private studio called Straight Story and would develop Vanquish, a futuristic third-person shooter published by Sega. He also collaborated with Goichi Suda of No More Heroes fame on the EA-published title Shadows of the Damned. In 2010, Mikami would create a new studio called Tango Gameworks that would be purchased by Zenimax Media, the parent company of Fallout and Elder Scrolls developer Bethesda Game Studios, later that same year. He would go on to direct the 2014 survival horror title The Evil Within before moving to a more supervisory role in the company. Mikami has stated that he'd like to create another game in the future, but for now he has his hands full running Tango Gameworks. Maybe someday he'll make his triumphant return and inspire the video game industry once more. Even in their earliest forms, video games have all had their big landmarks new titles that would completely revolutionize certain aspects or mechanics and change the way development was approached in many of the games that came after them. Oftentimes, these revolutionary ideas are made by people and companies that take a big risk and try something new with an already established brand or concept. Having horror take a back seat in a Resident Evil game was one of these moments in history that could have gone completely wrong 
and tanked one of Capcom's most successful franchises. However, Shinji Mikami stuck to his vision and ended up creating a game that would continue to influence and inspire other developers years and years after its initial release. The legacy of Resident Evil 4 is one that will continue long into the future and show people that sometimes making a risky change can pay off in a big way. What are you buying, stranger? Hey, thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, this is another one that's very near and dear to my heart. Uh, I love this game so much. I've been through it 30 to 40 times since it's come out in 2005, and it's just an incredibly important game for the industry and just, just great all around. So as usual, if you haven't played this game, uh, don't mind the spoilers. The story's really not that much to write home about. It's all about the gameplay and just having fun with it. So I would highly recommend checking it out. It's on literally everything uh, that I can think of. If you have a PS5, it's even backwards compatible with PS4 and, and Xbox Series X and, and all that fun stuff. Uh, so yeah, thanks again for watching. Uh, check out some of the other videos. Uh, if you want to see something else, please let me know. Uh, and take care. Thank you.